uh, Peter, please give the, uh, call the meeting to order. Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians, Governor Chacha Camacho, our lovely aunts and guests. I now call the 16th regular meeting of the Rotary Club of Makati to order. I'd like to call up uh, President Marga as well for the Paseo de Rojas Club. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Marga de Vinagracia. On behalf of the Rotary Club of Makati, Paseo de Rojas, I now call this meeting to order. Now we'd like to move on to the invocation, care of uh, PP Junjun. Let us put ourselves in God's presence, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, thank you for gathering us once more for our regular club meeting. Thank you for delivering us who live here in Metro Manila from the typhoon that ravaged the Philippines a few days ago. And we ask for your grace to have the strength and perseverance to help those who were greatly affected. Thank you for keeping us healthy and safe all these months of this terrible pandemic. And thank you for our speakers this afternoon who will share with us their expertise in investing. Be with us during this meeting and in the remaining days and weeks of this year. All this we ask in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. As this is the uh, last, uh, first meeting of November, we spend a few moments or minutes in remembrance of our members who have passed away. Hi, Jun Jun, you're in the office? Huh? Yes. <laughs> uh, we now proceed to the...
Thank you. We'll now move on to the national anthem. Sam, Mahati him. things we say do is it the truth is it fair to all concerned will it build goodwill and better friendships will it be beneficial to all concerned greetings and birthday wedding announcements happy birthday to Ramon Ramon Nivera November 5 Ador Hizon November 7 Rodri Anz Marilyn Velayo November 5 Maureen Sung November 6, Joanne Manyalak, November 8, LNB9, November 9, Wedding Anniversaries, Boy and Jeline Arteche, November 3, Peter and Elena Coyuto, November 7. Are they here? They're here. Uh, congratulations. Introduction of visiting guests and retirants. Uh, Ron, I don't have the list yet. Could you, can someone read it out? One moment. Okay, sorry. Rotary Ans, F.A. Pam Manzano, Nelly Bengson, Yvonne Kwan, Lulim Hoko, Menchu Pascual, and Maida Prieto. District Governor Chacha Camacho, welcome. Perfect Vision Presidents, Imelda Siria Terriales, RC Bonifacio Global City, Loreto Samaniego, RC Las Piñas Camino Real, Edulin Garma, RC Makati Central, Christy 
Blandina, sorry, Aldave, RC Makati Northeast, Fernan Mabanta, RC Makati Poblacion, Enrico Trinidad, RC Makati Premier District, Katie Lopez, Muntinlap, Muntinlupa North, Calixto Isidro Obong, Paranaque Central, Danny Delfin, RC Paranaque St. Andrew, Mary Joy Aniar, RC Puerto Princesa Uptown. Guests, President Peter Manzano's son, Mark Anthony Manzano, SAG Misha Ruiz, RC Taguig West, Rudy Act Club of Makati PE, Mark Banal, Kaila Bagsik, Phil Sionil, Mary B. Lamers, PP Julie Rabe, uh, RC Las Pinas East, Victoriano Yap, RC Papakat, Makati Poblacion, Madeline, and our Credit Swiss uh, speakers and uh, team, Albert Puja Daswani, Dominic First, Karina Lee, Cindy Pratiwi, Cherry Torres, and Josephine Yap. Uh, now we move on to the president's time. Uh, President Peter, please start. Okay. Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians, our lobbyists, and guests. Here's to apprise you of the goings on in the in our club. First, let me congratulate our Rotaractors for a job well done last Friday, as they successfully held their first webinar on voters registration via Zoom. The, web, the webinar was attended by more than 100 participants. In fact, it's 140 uh, with no less than attorney James Jimenez, the spokesperson of Comelec who gave the webinar. Thank you also to our partner clubs in our district whose uh, Rotaract Club members participated in said webinar. We still have a long way to go, but with the help of uh, our youth leaders, I'm sure this movement we're trying to lead will soon gain traction until it reaches its full speed. Second, last week we met with Monsignor Jerry Santos of St. Peter and Paul uh, for the bridge feeding project, which we would like to do uh, for those who really need our help. We shall be giving out pre-packed lunches to our beneficiaries by going to their places as a lot of them cannot go out. We hope to extend the project to other parishes as apparently many are seeking help in providing food for those directly affected by the pandemic. Third, as two typhoons have hit, uh, just hit the country one after the other, we have provided relief to the residents of Claberia, Cagayan last week, as their houses were nearly buried by flash floods in their area when Typhoon Quinta hit the nation. And, when the, and with the devastation caused by the recent Typhoon Rolly, we shall be providing relief goods in Bay Laguna, Batangas, Marina Sur, Sarsogon, and in Catanduanes. We are working with our partner Rotary Clubs the ABS-CBN Sagip Kapamilya and with the Office of the Vice President in a relief goods operation. Incidentally, I would like to thank uh, Rotarian Arthur Antonino who donated 100,000 in addition to our relief operations with ABS-CBN. To Rotarian Taba Samson who also donated 50,000 to the entire activity and to Director Eddie Galvez who was able to raise another 100,000 from his friends for our relief efforts. So we shall be out starting tomorrow up to Saturday as we shall be delivering the lift goods to those affected by the recent typhoon. Those who are able to join us, uh, kindly contact our Chief of Staff, Ron, for the details. Again, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Carlo, can I have a few words also? I just want to make one short announcement. Yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, we're now preparing the final plans for... Uh, the last uh, angel uh, Christmas uh, giveaway group in December. So <clears throat> we're still preparing uh, the detailed plans, but uh, I just would like to take this opportunity to ask everybody to, uh, we'll be passing our hat later on uh, this month uh, in preparation for funding the gifts that we give to these orphanages and other uh, special uh, locations where the kids uh, are, are located. Uh, please uh, expect uh, a call from the committee uh, later this month uh, for your contributions to support this very worthwhile project of Last Angels. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Peter and President uh, Peter for the time. Okay, um, uh, President Marga, if you, uh, any, any words, please? 
Yes, hi, good afternoon. I, I'm going to keep this short. I would just like to thank first uh, the Rotary Club of Makati, headed by President Peter Manzano, and uh, President, as President Joya from the Rotary Club of uh, Kati Pasay de Rojas and Dominic First for making this uh, webinar with Credit Swiss possible. Secondly, I'd like to welcome and give special mention to our project partner in one of our global grants, which is Pure Oceans. Uh, they were headed by Pia and Silka, and they are here this afternoon to join us. And thank you, everyone. Govcha, thank you for being Govcha. Cha, thank you for being here. And I hope this will be a uh, an informative and educational afternoon for all of us. Thank you. Uh, we got the introduction of guest speakers. Uh, first, I'd like to do an initial introduction of why this, uh, why this uh, talk came about. Um, we basically, I've seen some projects called Microfinance and the 3H Water Project previously. And I, I noticed how good those projects were and the fact that once they were funded, they actually self-funded themselves and grew into multiple uh, other projects. So it's almost like a seed fund or a starter fund. So I've been looking for this format in, in Rotary projects moving forward. And I came upon this with my, one of my private bankers, uh, Dominic First. And he did show me this uh, impact investing. And I said, this is the model that maybe we need to look at for Rotary in terms of projects in the future. Um, self-sustaining projects which allow for investments. Well, now, while profit is one of the considerations, the bigger uh, element of this is the fact that uh, it's sustainable on its own and it's able to grow as a starter fund and move on to other projects. So at this time, I'd like to ask uh, Dominic, please uh, introduce the guest speakers who'll be talking about the topic today. Thank you, Carlo. That's uh, very uh, kind uh, to invite us uh, to be here on, uh, on this uh, presentation for you. Uh, on behalf of Credit Suisse's team, um, both uh, located out of Hong Kong, Singapore, and uh, the Philippines, I'd like to, first of all, um, provide my thanks to the President Peter Marzano of uh, Rotary Club Makati and President Marga Divini, uh, Divina Garcia of uh, Rotary Club Makati Paseo de Rojas for having us and giving us uh, a platform. And also thank you to you, Carlo, and uh, past President Junjun Dairit. Uh, it's an honor to be here. So from our side, we have um, Albert Ma, who is the team leader for the Philippines uh, markets uh, in private banking based out of Hong Kong with myself. Uh, we have out of um, Manila, uh, my colleague, uh, Josephine Yap, who was also introduced before by our uh, president. And um, we have our guest speakers who will be um, uh, starting the presentation shortly. So first I'd like to acknowledge uh, Dr. James Gifford. So uh, James is our global head of impact advisory and uh, finance for Credit Suisse. Um, he is also a academic and teacher and um, does his teaching at the Harvard Kennedy School on uh, impact finance and um, environmental sustainable investments. Um, he was also the founding executive director of the UN Principles for Responsible Investing, which are the guiding principles which uh, the investment community uses to benchmark its investments. Our second speaker is going to be uh, Joost Bilkes. He's the head of the said department based out of Singapore, and he's been instrumental in uh, addressing and uh, working with our clients in their impact investment and environmentally uh, sound investment strategies. Uh, so he's leading a team uh, of uh, several specialists uh, which work very closely and on an actionable basis out of Singapore. So without further ado, I'd just like to pass on uh, the word or the floor to James and Joost uh, to provide us with uh, the presentation that we wanna share with you uh, this afternoon. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dominic. Let me just thanks, Dominic. turn this on. Well, thanks very much, everybody. And I'm really delighted to be able to speak with you today. Uh, let's jump into it. So today we're gonna to be talking about sustainable and impact investing and the impact that it can have and really try to, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> enlighten you, I guess, about the potential for sustainable and impact investing, not only to make money, 
uh, but also to create a, a, an important impact, positive impact in the world beyond philanthropy. So this is the sustainable investing spectrum, and it goes all the way from traditional investments right through to philanthropy on the other end. So let's just run through this quickly. So exclusion, Yoast, what is exclusion? Um, so exclusion is that you're avoiding um, uh, simply said things you don't like or you don't agree with. So you could, for example, exclude investments in tobacco or weapons um, and, and you would uh, furthermore kind of run your portfolio as you would normally do, but you would exclude these, um, these areas or certain, um, or certain specific companies. Yeah, and exclusions was really invented some hundreds of years ago by the Quakers. Uh, Christian um, organization uh, back in the 17 and 1800s and they were pacifist and they didn't drink alcohol. So they invented the first mutual fund that didn't include weapon manufacturers or alcohol uh, manufacturers uh, and, and this has continued to this day. Uh, ESG integration, Yoast, what's that mean? Yeah, so he here actually you're starting to look at ESG Data. So well, that's what is ESG? Data. So, no, exactly. So let, let's start there. So E is the environmental related uh, data points and then social related uh, data points and governance. So very simply said, um, if, you, if you would have a company, you would rate the company and say, okay, you don't um, uh, pollute the environment, you're nice to your staff and you're not being corrupt. So I'm, I'm simplifying here. Then you would have a high score on ESG. So if you would use that type of data for companies, you can integrate that in your portfolio and you can do them very in many different ways. But a very simple way would be to rate all the companies in a certain sector and say, well, I will only allocate, for example, to the top 50 or top 25%. Uh, you can also make it more um, uh, complicated and really actively use this information to, deri to derive alpha or outperformance because you're going to select companies that are strategically better positioned for a more sustainable future. So, so it's, it's kind of, that's the whole span from a very simple methodology to actively using the data and arriving um, of our outperformance. Yeah, so exclusion is more of a moral or ethical choice. I don't wanna have alcohol, I don't wanna have tobacco, uh, I don't wanna have weapons or pornography. ESG integration is looking at uh, environmental performance, social performance, corporate governance, and saying, I want to invest in the companies that are forward looking, that are managing these issues well. But both exclusion and integration strategies are, are mostly in listed equities and bonds. So we're talking about mutual funds, commercial investments, and these are one of the grow fastest growing areas of the investment sector globally. So moving to thematic and impact investing, this is where we're starting to focus on themes uh, like renewable energy or education or healthcare that are actually trying to solve uh, the world's problems. So Yoast, what would be an example of a thematic and impact aligned uh, uh, investment strategy? Um, so as you said, what you could do, for example, is um, you could have a strategy around, let's say, smart mobility. So thinking um, in different ways, so how are we going to um, kind of change mobility and, and do it in a way that we use technology, um, um, that we use infrastructure, um, that we use business models that are more efficiently um, kind of implementing our, our mobility uh, challenges um, and specifically of course also then the, the large element would be around um, uh, renewable energy or electrification of the fleet um, so that could be a, a really big theme and if you think about it it would be gigantic now if you think about cars for example I think um, today all fossil fuel driven cars today are, are presenting a value of about a trillion um, so that's the type of size of investment opportunity you would look at here um, in such thematic focused um, investment strategy. Yeah, and so that's where but most of these are also listed equities or bonds. So liquid investments, but into themes uh, that are actually contributing to, to addressing the world's challenges. Now, impact investing uh, is where 
you are investing directly into companies. Um, and this is mostly in private markets. That is private equity, venture capital, private debt, unlisted real estate. And the real difference between the thematic and impact aligned and impact investing is that impact investing, your money is going directly into the company in, in a private investment. Whereas in thematic and impact aligned, you're buying shares from somebody else on a liquid market. So your money isn't going directly in. Now within impact investing, there is returns first and impact first. Now everything inside the green dotted line is fully commercial investment strategies. This is just, you make just as much money as anything else. These are fully commercial, you know, businesses that are growing fast, uh, that make real money. Now impact first is where you start having uh, strategies that don't care as much about making money, but they put the impact first. And that might be uh, in um, more high risk areas of the world, startups, small, um, uh, you know, uh, minority led or women led businesses in, in remote parts of the country. And, and this is the area uh, where there's some real commonality with philanthropy, uh, where you can get funds that sustain themselves because they do make a profit, but they might only make a small profit. So it's more like recycling your impact. Uh, whereas the return first is more like commercial venture capital. So Yos, can you give us an example of a return first impact investing investment versus an impact first impact investment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so maybe what's interesting is um, um, what we could do is stay at, at a certain uh, specific theme because I think that's always easier to look at it. So let's look at education, for example. So, so if you think of um, if you think of education um, from a pure investment point of view, and you want to create a market rate return, um, and you want to bring um, education to um, kind of low income communities, and you want to scale it. Um, so what would happen then is that, um, you know, you would want to invest in a company that probably brings education through um, mobile telephones, a little learning journeys, and that you can easily um, scale up um, uh, through the internet, through mobile telephones, et cetera. Um, so if you would do that, and you can imagine, and, and just in Asia, if you, and, and you, you can do that for the Philippines, you can do it for Indonesia, for example, you have hundreds of millions of people in Southeast Asia that are that need this access, and if you can find a platform where, for one or two dollars a month, you can get access to good quality education for your primary and your secondary school kids, um, you know you can you can calculate how much money you can make. It can be very profitable as a business. But you can also say then, um, and and just as example, on the philanthropic side, um, you could, for example, look at. Um, um, orphanages. So how are you going to make a business model and scale, for example, uh, a setup of, of orphanages? That's going to be really challenging and tough. So so there you might want to look at a, a variation between donations um, and maybe a model whereby the school system would be partly partially supported by government and partially by private money. Um, so this could be a combination of where um, you would look really at um, uh, the impact first, and you wouldn't invest with your normal capital in such investment. Um, but the earlier example I gave, if you have a very efficient, scalable model, and everybody can via the mobile telephone get access to it, um, then that could be a very interesting um, a return first um, um, impact investment. Now, so I think the Gates Foundation is a really good example of an impact first impact investor. Now, obviously they also do a lot of philanthropy, but they are actually investing in for-profit businesses, but at very, very early stages where it's very, very risky. And they are putting in seed capital into these early stage companies, for example, in the next generation of nuclear energy or in vaccine production, where someday they may make money. But in the early, early days, they are taking a huge amount of risk. So uh, I think it can have a tremendous positive impact. So let's jump forward and, and just look. 
So I think it's important to recognize that for most of the strategies uh, that are commercial, they are delivering just as good of returns as anything else. So this is the exclusions, the integration, the thematic and impact aligned, and the returns first impact investments, they are delivering very good financial performance. So you can now uh, transfer your portfolio, and we have many, many clients who have done this, transfer, transfer uh, their portfolio into sustainable and impact investments uh, and deliver the same financial returns uh, as any traditional portfolio. And then you can add on the impact first strategies uh, as part of your philanthropy or semi-philanthropic uh, uh, aspect. So we just wanna to touch on just quickly four key segments that uh, are growing incredibly fast where you can have it all. You can make money and you can have tremendous uh, impact uh, particularly on low-income uh, communities. So, Yost, could you, uh, since you've been investing in these, uh, can you talk through really quickly why are these four sectors very interesting in Asia right now? Yeah, no, absolutely. So, so I think coming back to the earlier point, um, uh, it's, it's an, uh, the base of pyramid. So the base of the pyramid are, are is this World Bank terminology of people earning less than eight dollars a day. So in Asia, you have more than a billion people living at the base of the pyramid. Now, if you think about that, that means that if you can service these people um, with a very scalable solution, either in healthcare or, or uh, access services or education or egg, um, so food-related transactions. Um, then, then that could be actually really profitable as a business. Now, if you think about, again, numbers, so we, we're looking today at 48% at of people in Asia um, having access to, um, to the web. Um, in the next five years, that's expected to go to, to high 60s. So if you look at the absolute number of people getting access to the internet over the next five years, it's 900 million people in Asia. So you can just imagine um, what kind of enormous force. So you have a billion people that are focusing and really their first need is this really basic um, type sector. So access to healthcare, financial services, education, food. And then you have this, this ability to digitize, uh, digitize a lot of these services. So, so this is really an interesting sweet spot to combine tech for these basic goods and services and solutions for the base of the pyramid. So I think here you can, and, and maybe I, I don't know if you have time for it, um, James, I can give one or two uh, examples quickly or. Yeah, yeah, well, let's give an example, but, but just to reinforce this point, you know, a lot of yep. people say, well, you know, I understand philanthropy, you know, we are, we are helping people, we are providing scholarships, we are helping low income people, but this the FinTech and health tech, ed tech, this is just normal business. Why, why, would, why would we think of this in the same way as we think of philanthropy? And I think the answer is because these sectors create tremendous impact on people's lives, tremendous positive impact, and they need risk capital, right? These are all venture capital firms, and the more that's invested in them, the faster they can grow and deliver uh, positive benefits uh, to literally millions and millions of people. So it's a different form of impact than direct philanthropy, but it is tremendously impactful. And these early stage companies actually need investment uh, as well. So do you want to give a couple of examples? Yeah, no, I'm just thinking what maybe in in the Philippines itself, what's a very interesting uh, business that we're we're involved in is um, it's it's one that looks at diagnostic care. So if you if you think of the United States, there's a shortage of radiologists, for example, and in the United States, for every hundred thousand people, you have eight radiologists. And as you if you were, you probably know as well that if you're in the United States, you're a radiologist, you get paid half a million dollars because there's just not enough of them. Um, if you look in Southeast Asia, and this is across Southeast Asia and specifically also for the Philippines, it's, it's 0.8 person 
that doesn't exist, but 0 0.8 percent just to compare it on 100,000 people. So, so you have a shortage in the United States. If you look at Southeast Asia and specifically the Philippines, it's, it's way, way worse than it's ever been in the United States. So this, we're working with a company that's thinking, how can we use this radiologist diagnostic resource? How can we use that way more efficient? And we're forced to do that um, because we just don't have enough radiologists. So, so th this company built and developed a tool that are doing two things. So one, it's guiding the radiologist for better outcomes. So it's actually helping them and guiding through the diagnostic process. So you have a way, way better outcome at the end of the diagnosis. And secondly, it's, it's using technology so you can actually connect um, to central points or hubs where radiologists would look at, at scans from very low bandwidth internet uh, locations throughout the Philippines. Um, so, so this is an excellent um, kind of example whereby you use technology um, where you use resources in a way smarter way. And just as one last point on this deal, so when we did due diligence on this transaction, I know it very vividly, I, I did my annual uh, check that's credit to space for us, so you can do this check, and I, I think I was t turning 40 or something. So, um, um, and I had to pay for a scan, I had to pay 998 Sing dollars. And I was doing due diligence on this company in the Philippines, and I could do the same scan under $15. And I just couldn't believe it. And the other good thing about this company was, um, they would give you back the, the, the diagnosis within 15 minutes. Well, I had to wait, wait a week here in Singapore to get the, 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 the outcomes uh, back. So just to give, I mean, th it's amazing how you can leapfrog with these type of uh, uh, companies. Yeah, and, and there's another company that we know well in Indonesia in the ed tech space that has an app for school age children and has close to 20 million subscribers. Uh, and and um, we invested into that company before it was earning any revenue and took significant risk. And now that company is, um, uh, is just doing incredibly well. And when COVID hit, this company was able to deliver schooling over the phone every day, day in, day out through the whole of the lockdown for people across Indonesia, uh, they got free internet access from the uh, telecommunications providers for this app as well. And so the, the impact of these fast growing companies is tremendous, but you can also make really good money investing in them. Now, it's also important to recognize that it's not either impact investing or philanthropy. A lot of uh, people do both in the sense that they will create a foundation with their uh, philanthropic um, goals and the foundation will invest in high impact companies to make more money and recycle that money and then they will take their grant making off the top of that portfolio. Uh, so this is a very common uh, approach. So let's jump into uh, some examples. Um, so remember we had the four categories, uh, exclusions, integration, thematic, and impact investing. So we're gonna do three of these ourselves, and then we're going to ask you, the audience, to vote on the final three. So you're gonna have to do some work, so we hope you've been paying attention. And um, so you'll get three examples, from us and then we will ask you to vote on the final three. Okay, so Yoast, the Red Rose Microfinance Fund, where would that sit in this spectrum? Yeah, so um, these are small private, um, so it's private debt, small loans, um, emerging countries. So I, I would say that this is, um, there's a lot of additionality. This would be capital that otherwise wouldn't go to poor people um, providing access to financial services to them. So I would call this an impact investment uh, fund. And, and microfinance is, tends to be fairly low risk, um, but because it's, these are small companies and small fund managers, we just put it as a medium risk. Um, okay, Blue Seas Engagement Fund. Now, this is shareholder engagement which uses the power of investors like a, an, uh, to push companies to improve, like a shareholder activist fund. Uh, Joost, where would this sit? 
Yeah, that's a re really good question, James, because from your earlier presentation, you mentioned that um, it's very hard to make impact or create additionality when you're investing in liquid market. But this seemed to be a liquid, a liquid market solution. Um, so you're saying that you can still make an impact in liquid markets, listening to you earlier now. So if you're engaged with companies and the intentionality is there and you can measure the change and the impact you're making with your capital going into this company. So I, I would I would say this could even be an impact solution, although it is although it is liquid. Is yes. that is that what, what do you say? Yes. So most liquid solutions, that is stocks and bond funds are not impact investment because you're just buying the shares from somebody else on a liquid market. However, if you do shareholder engagement and shareholder activism, that is where the shareholder uses its power to push companies to improve and you can evidence that you are improving those companies, that is direct impact. So that's kind of the exception to the rule. Um, so the third one, large cap ESG, environmental social governance, equity ETF, an exchange traded fund. So large cap passive <laughs> equities, S&P 500, but excluding tobacco, gambling, and pornography. Uh, Yost, where would you put this? Yeah, I think that's a clear exclusion strategy now. So um, we started all the way at the beginning of our presentation with that. So it's uh, excluding some um, some sectors um, and it's, it's um, yeah, large liquid um, names in it. So, so that's, yeah, exclusions. Um, and Great. it's equity, so it's probably yeah, mid, mid to, mid to slightly yeah. higher risk. Yeah. So now it's your turn. So if everyone can pay attention, uh, a green bond fund. So these are triple B rated actively managed global fixed income funds. So they're liquid. They aim to outperform the green bond market. Green bonds are issued by companies, banks, and supranational entities like the World Bank to finance green projects and they are highly liquid. So if we can have the poll, uh, Cindy, can we, what do we think? Is a green bond fund exclusions, integration, thematic or impact investing? We'll give you 15 seconds. What do people think? Oh, there's a bit of a mix. We'll give you give you a few more seconds. Let's get a few more of you voting. Well, we're only up to 20 something percent voted. Everyone else needs to jump on and give it a vote. Just click the screen. Uh, you should be able to have options on your screen. Okay, a couple more seconds. On. We can get a few more voters here. Okay, we're up to 30% of you have voted. Let's get a few more. Okay, so we think the, the, the more people think it's thematic and impact aligned. Uh, so, uh, and, then, and then impact investing, then integration and exclusion. So Yoast, where would you put a green bond fund that's highly liquid? Yeah, I think if it's clear where the proceeds of these bonds are going, I, I would I would quite agree with the 47%, I think, because it would be aligned with what I would like to see happen. Um, uh, but it's highly liquid, so the, the, the you know you, you, the capital is available anyway for those um, proceeds to be uh, financed. Um, so yeah, I, I would I would go for C. Yeah, exactly. So you're buying these bonds from other people. So the project has already been financed and the bonds have been issued. And so this would be a thematic or impact aligned strategy. And we put it fairly low risk because this is triple B rated. Okay, next one, the emerging consumer fund. This is a mid cap emerging market active equities fund. The fund invests in Asian companies tapping into the emerging middle class uh, fund engages robustly to push companies to implement ESG strategies. Uh, okay, let's get the poll. Okay, let's see if we can get more than half of you voting. Come on, everybody, you must have a view by now. Let's go. 
or we've got integration, looks like it's uh, getting some traction. Still. Yep. Okay, we've got, oh, we've beaten our number from last time. So let's keep voting. Let's see if we can get more than half of you. So then it becomes a truth, huh? <laughs> Okay, so let's um, finish up the poll. So most people, the great majority of people felt, feel it's integration. Um, what do you think, Joost? Where would you put this? Yeah, I think we have, uh, we have probably quite a, um, a crowd that's paying, paying good attention. Um, yeah, if it's, if it's a liquid strategy that is um, um, kind of considering ESG, uh, criteria, but but uh, taking it a, a, a bit further because they're really pushing the companies to um, to um, strategically position for for different topics, um, either environmental, social, governance uh, related. So yeah, integration I think would be would be a good. I would do. I would say. B. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's. Um. I I sort of thought. Oh, maybe this is thematic, but no. Actually, now you say it, I think um, probably B is better. So ignore my uh, conclusion there. And let's do the final one, Asian Private Equity Impact Fund, small and medium enterprise private equity venture capital fund focuses on economic opportunities in small and medium enterprises serving the base of the pyramid, uh, target sectors, agriculture, healthcare, education, access to finance. Okay, let's run the poll. What do people think? Yep, this one um, looks like we're getting some consensus towards impact investing. Okay, let's finish the poll. Yes, impact investing is the winner here, 79%. Uh, Yoast, would you agree? Yeah, I would I would vote D as well. Yeah, um, I think here we are where um, the intentionality is there. We're bringing capital uh, to the balance sheet of smaller companies. Um, there's a clear uh, large uh, enterprise impact. Um, yeah, so definitely. Great. So let's let's um, jump on. So now you have a sense of the four strategies and what types of funds go in there. Now let's talk a bit more about the impact investing end of that spectrum. So this is the total investment gap to uh, solve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. It's 2.5 trillion US dollars a year for the next 10 years to really make a dent on the biggest problems humanity faces. However, sustainable and impact investing is growing incredibly fast. Um, we have global impact investing growing at a thousand percent over a few years and global sustainable investing is growing at 122 percent every year so here is the sustainable development goals funding gap two and a half trillion whereas the full amount of sustainable investments growing per year is three and a half trillion so what's going on? We've got all of this growth in sustainable investments, but we still have a funding gap. So what's going on here? So Yost, do you have a sense of why we haven't solved all, all of the world's problems already? Yeah, this is, I love these, uh, these couple of slides now because they, they kind of showcase probably our biggest challenge in a sense. No? So, um, we need an enormous amount of money to address the sustainable development goals. Sorry, can it, sorry guys, if you're not talking, can you go on mute, please? Thank you. Um, so, so it is an enormous amount needed to solve the, the problem around sustainable development goals. Um, but then the sustainable investments is so rapidly growing. So I, I think, James, but I'm curious to see what you say, but I, I would say, um, 
you know, probably not all the sustainable investments are directly solving for the sustainable development goals. So they're not that mm. impactful, so to say. So, so the key point here is not all sustainable investments are created equal when it comes to impact, which is why we have the term impact investing. The great bulk of that three and a half trillion in sustainable investments is in exclusion strategies, ESG integration and thematic, which involves buying shares from somebody else on a liquid market. So it's great for your portfolio construction, but it's not generating that direct impact in the way that impact investing or philanthropy can do. So let's have another poll. So we can't use real names. So we have a, a large cap, fast growing electric vehicle company um, who, who, you know, there may be some real ones in the world that might come to mind. Uh, but um, so here's the, here's the question. Um, does the company, does this company, a large cap, fast growing electric vehicle company have a positive impact on the climate? Can you put up the poll? What do people think? Okay, so there's a very good consensus here. If, if we can finish the poll, about about seventy percent of people think that this company is likely to have a positive impact on the climate. And why? Because they're they're forcing the electrification of the entire auto industry. And if the grid electricity, which is also becoming greener over time, uh, feeds that renewable energy and so on into the cars then it will um, produce uh, more outcomes uh, for the climate. However, let's go to the next but, but poll. James, Sorry, yes. James, James, can I ask you just the devil's advocate a little bit? So, I mean, now we all want to drive an electric car. So what about your cobalt uh, being mined in the Congo? I mean, that's not very positive. I don't know if you saw the latest reports. It's horrendous. It's horrendous things are happening there at the moment. It will just grow because everybody wants to have more batteries and more electric cars and then you're saying you know in an easy way you say oh yeah uh, we, we we have to uh, use renewable energy to power the grid but that's in most countries in Southeast Asia is not the case as you well know so how, how can you say this is such a such a positive impact on the climate yeah so look, if we want to take action on climate change we have to find a way to electrify transportation if we don't electrify transportation, we will never meet the climate goals. So I think it's inevitable. And uh, I, I think where the electricity is generated, whether that's from coal or gas or renewables, uh, I also think that it's inevitable that over coming decades, technologies will be developed that are actually cheaper uh, than fossil fuels and then those grids will become uh, greener. So, uh, I mean, in terms of the mining, uh, yes, there's some terrible human rights issues in mining in Congo, for example. But I think, um, you know, we, we need to address human rights in the mining industry uh, rather than not addressing, uh, you know, climate change. So I think we need to do both uh, there. But just for this exercise, uh, we're just uh, assuming that electric vehicles are overall, when you take into all of these things, are, are actually good for the environment. Now, the second polling question, same company, does buying shares in this company have a positive impact on the climate? It's a large cap listed equities company. Does buying shares in this company have an imp positive impact on the climate. So views are a bit more mixed. Give people a few more minutes.
Okay, so if we can close the poll, we have just over half people believe, yes, buying shares in this company uh, has a positive impact on the climate. So Yoast, what do you think? Yeah, it's a tricky question. Um, I think, well, so if I think about it, so if it's a really large listed company and I would buy the share so I can make a positive impact um, and I would buy the shares from you, for example, James, I think that um, the company doesn't get extra capital. The company doesn't even know that you are holding the shares or I are holding the shares. So I think I don't think it makes any impact at all. But So one, one way to think about this is <clears throat> Once a company is already trading on a highly liquid stock market, if you buy some shares in that company, you will be like the millionth trade that second because global stock markets are so liquid and the frequency of trading is so high, it's very unlikely that you buying shares in that company, once it's a large cap company, will make any difference uh, to the world. And I think this is an important learning. And it's also kind of intuitive, right? If you say, okay, I'm gonna either put money into a venture capital uh, deal, early stage, or I'm gonna buy shares in large cap US company, which is really gonna make a difference to the world? Well, I think it's kind of intuitive that the venture capital will probably make a difference because your money is literally going into the bank account of the company. So let's go to the next, the next poll. Does buying shares in this company, but during their series B venture capital round in 2006 have a positive impact on the climate? What do people think? Okay, if you, we'll give you another 30 seconds. <clears throat> what do people think? Buying shares in a venture capital round back in 2006. Okay, let's close the poll. So we have about 75% of people say yes. So Yoast, what do you think about venture capital round yeah i think i think i would agree with the with this with the 70 percent um because here the capital is really going to kind of into the company directly um at that time series b probably not that easy to raise money for them i don't know they were probably not making money just thinking how capital intense it is to um to um to start to start a, kind of a car production house um, so yeah, that would be extremely impactful, I think, if you would have given them capital at that time. Um, so yeah, I, I would say yes. Yeah, so this is the, this is the really key, key learning. Once a, once a company is listed on the stock markets or, or issuing bonds on bond markets, there's very little impact to be had from simply buying those stocks. Whereas if you're actually injecting money into earlier stage companies, that is highly impactful. Now, it's still a very different type of impact from direct philanthropy, but it is very impactful and can be very scalable uh, as well. So let's look at, look at this concept. So the double delta, and we just did a publication on this, investor impact and company impact. So you can have a company which has got a lot of impact but if you buy the shares once the company's already listed, then you will have virtually no impact. Whereas if you invest in the company in the early stage, you'll have a lot of impact. Uh, so we have the investor impact, is the impact that investors have on the companies through their financing. Then you have the company impact, which is the impact that the companies have on the planet uh, and people through their goods and services. So that's really the key, one of the key learnings um, to take away is that as investors, uh, we, we can have a, a, a different impact. So let's just quickly look at dimensions of company impact. 
So this is the impact that the companies themselves are having on the world, the ed tech companies, the healthcare companies, um, the agricultural companies. What outcomes does the effect drive and how important are they to the people and the planet uh, experiencing them? Uh, who experiences the outcome and are they underserved? That is, is it a low income community who is benefiting, for example? And how much uh, does the uh, outcome, how much of the outcome uh, occurs and does it happen at scale? For example, could a small investment into a healthcare technology actually become a, eventually a huge listed company that could actually deliver a tremendous amount of uh, impact? So Yoast, when you're investing in a company, how do you think about the amount of impact it's creating? Yeah, it's a very good question. James, I also see on this slide, we, we also have a little video. Do you want me first cover uh, uh, oh. or, or just go through it? Or do you want to share the video? But let, maybe let it's me, nice to... Let me share this. Impact and... Investment deploys capital and businesses for positive social and environmental change. This investment snapshot shows how it works. Today's snapshot looks at a diagnostic software company. Philippines has a chronic shortage of qualified radiologists. Nowhere near enough to read scans and diagnose serious diseases like tuberculosis. Only one radiologist per 100,000 inhabitants. Moreover, qualified radiologists are based in city hospitals. This limits access for people in rural areas with life and death consequences in some cases. In a country like Philippines, with over 7,000 islands, our investment is in a company that enables remote reading of scans. This solves the access issue. It also facilitates access to additional diagnostic services, diagnostic reading of x-rays, MRIs, CT scans, and ultrasounds via internet browsers and cloud databases. As the company grows in Philippines and more hospitals and clinics acquire the software, more of the poor can be served, driving further revenue and growth. So the greater the reach, the greater the impact. The company is attracting more hospital and clinic clients throughout the Philippines, and it's also expanding across Southeast Asia. So as you can see, doing good and doing well can go hand in hand. Stay tuned for our next impact investment snapshot soon. Uh, thanks, Yo. So, so do you want to just comment a little bit on um, uh, on the impact uh, and and how you think about the degree of impact that a company can generate? Yeah, absolutely. So, so if we look through the kind of three, the what, the who, and the how much. Um, so specifically, um, when we're starting looking at at companies and and before we invest, we're doing an assessment. Okay, what is what is the problem? we have at hand here. So in here, it's very clearly, it's quality of um, diagnostics in the example, and it is short, shortage of radiologists. Um, so those would be the, the key um, um, areas that we would focus on. And why would the company um, solve for this issue? So that's the first key point. Um, and, and therefore, you and we do that for every single company we would invest in when we look at impact investing. So it's actually a very, um, kind of tedious process, and you'll see that a lot of companies, if you look at, if you really dig into this, into the problem, what it's solving, then maybe the company is not really addressing the key issue, or it's addressing the key issue for the wrong people, mm -hmm. which which bring, brings me to the second point. So when we looked at this deal, um, we we were really looking at, okay, does it make sense to implement this business, um, you know, in the larger Manila area, or would it be really beneficial um, to actually reach out? Um, you know, to go all the way to to um, to uh, Luzon, for example, um, or or Mindanao, um, and and really focus there and see what is wh who are we um, impacting, mm. what is, and then we look at things like, um, you know, what is the access to healthcare, what type of access to what type of healthcare, what is the income, how it's being paid, how it's being paid for the diagnostic care specifically, or for the uh, follow-up medicine, for example. So that's a whole part of the assessment. 
and then the scalability piece. I mean, that's really, really important because if you look at solutions and it need to be an investable company where we're focusing and targeting, um, trying to get a market rate return because we're, we're, we're um, uh, raising capital from normal investment portfolios, the scalability component is extremely important. So, so that's kind of the, the, the final um, component of, of the analysis, so to say. So let's think about this uh, analysis. What is the impact? Who benefits and how much impact? How scalable is the company? Uh, and, and, um, and then uh, let's do the poll. Which, which do you all think is more impactful? An ed tech company uh, in Indonesia that has an app that serves the year one to 12 students or an organic chocolate company in, in Vietnam, uh, which uh, serves, um, you know, hundreds or a thousand uh, cocoa farmers um, with an organic chocolate brand. So what do people think? Let's vote. Okay, a few more people voting, a few more seconds. Put in your vote. Okay, uh, let's close the poll. So about 70% of people voted for EdTech. Um, so Yoast, let's run through those three dimensions. What is the impact, who benefits, and how much impact? will be generated by an ed tech company versus an organic chocolate company in impact investing. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so, yeah. So um, uh, looking at the two uh, kind of different business, I think for the, for the ed tech uh, deal, it's, it's really straightforward and, and kind of um, naturally, I think you'll tend towards that. Um, but of course it's solving a problem around um, access to education. So specifically the, the business that we have in the back of our mind and that we're involved in, um, James alluded to earlier, 20 million kids, primary, secondary education. Um, um, in Indonesia, you have uh, the difficulty around decentralized funding. You have all the islands. Um, there's a really kind of low, uh, the, the PISA OECD ranking, the quality of teachers and system is very low. So so there, it's very clear what, what it's trying to solve. Um, if you then think who benefits, or I already kind of incorporated it in, my, in, in, in the summary I just gave, but it's, you know, primary, secondary school kids. Um, and then how much? I mean, yeah, if you can scale this and it's easily accessible, so now more than half the people have access to the internet through their mobile telephones, and you can access this, this platform, Little Learning Journeys databases to prepare for your test at school, um, you know, then, then th that can be amazingly scalable. The real impact is, of course, how well do these kids do at school um, and how, how much do their tests improve? So that's something, I mean, for this company specifically, we, have, we use third parties to assess this so we can be very de decisive about the answer as well. If you look at the organic chocolate company, um, so I, <laughs> I mean, you know, for the chocolate lover. So, so I'm, I think I have a slightly different view than, than, than you, James, and maybe than the majority, but I, I don't see this as a chocolate deal. I see this as a, as a agri company. Okay. And, and I find it very hard personally to compare, you know, agri companies versus an healthcare versus an education company, but, but let's go through the exercise. So I would think if I would invest in this uh, type of business, um, that I would work probably with with farmers and see how I can educate them be better, how I maybe rotate to a high value crop, which definitely uh, 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 cocoa or chocolate is. So they, they have an enormous income increase. It's grown organically, so they don't have to use a pesticide. So there will be a positive healthcare impact. Um, um, so I'll create a route to market for them as well. Um, and then where is it grown? So if the chocolate is grown, let's go back to Mindanao or um, or, you know, uh, across Indonesia, really. Um, so, so there you can say, okay, how, what are the income levels of families there? Um, what are they making money on today? Um, you know, who, who are the families that specifically have access to either working on plantations or part of a cooperative or have their own little piece of land? Um, and then, so how scalable is it? I don't know. I mean, 
Um, so, of course, you know, 20 million people getting access to education, that's a lot. I mean, uh, that's not, you, you probably don't quickly find 20 million uh, uh, cocoa farmers. Um, but, but that said, you know, you could, you could come up with such a smart model that you can replicate it and you can replicate it in the Philippines. You can have this you know, amazing company working with corporatives and do it in, uh, start doing it in Indonesia, start doing it also across uh, Africa, for example. So I, I don't know. I find it very hard to compare you know, a hospital with a school. I just think, as, as we all know, there's a $2.5 trillion funding gap. We should fund it all. That, that, so, that would be my yes. answer. So, yeah. so, I mean, <laughs> yes, it would be great to fund it all, but we all have limited investment portfolios and, and we need to choose. And I, and I think that this, I mean, obviously, we can only tell in hindsight, right, some years down the track. But looking forward, I mean, I would say the first thing is, you know, technology, the ed tech technology is new and it's certainly new for developing countries. And so they're building out a frontier, whereas there's already a lot of chocolate companies, a lot of organic chocolate companies. There's no new technology here. So you're actually competing with other chocolate makers. And there's also plenty of organic chocolate being uh, developed, uh, being sold in the world. So my feeling is that EdTech has a lot more potential for additional impact uh, than a chocolate company. Um, that said, you know, if it's all in the execution, right? So if the chocolate company, <laughs> I mean, if, if the chocolate company ended up like green and black's chocolate, you know, uh, and, and becomes a global brand and ends up empowering 20 million farmers, then maybe it will be more impactful. But because we've got to make these judgments uh, earlier rather than later. Um, I'm sorry, I, yeah. I, I cut you off there. We've got a little time for a Q and A. Yeah. Okay, um, I'll, I'll yeah. jump. I'll jump to the Q and A, and because uh, we've just uh, finished. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Great. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, great, great ideas, guys. And we'd like to open up the floor for questions. I have a few in the chat group. Uh, first of it was uh, PP Jun Jun. Uh, his question is: What is the role of government? in encouraging this kind of high risk investment. So uh, for example, uh, would they add on to this is would we be required to give tax incentives or uh, tax holidays uh, for these kinds of businesses? Uh, do you see the government being involved or is it really a private uh, uh, enterprise? Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of these impact investments are just normal companies, right? So they're just small, normal startups whose products and services are highly impactful. So I think um, the role of government is to facilitate the growth of small business. So uh, are they uh, providing the rule of law? Are they providing stability? Uh, these kind of things that you would normally expect. I mean, in many developing countries, business is actually much harder to do than in developed countries. There are more permits, there's corruption. So I think the role of government is really to make it easier for business to just do what they do in, in countries, you know, like Singapore, where business is, is seen to be quite easy. There's also a role for um, governments in uh, funding um, risk-taking businesses in terms of development finance. So many uh, rich countries have development finance arms like, um, you know, OPIC in the United States or CDC from the UK or, or the Australian um, differed, yeah. So, so they can certainly um, uh, have, have play a role. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, secondly, uh, what is the role for, for uh, NGOs and Rotary Clubs for like us, for example, in helping out? Um, just to add to this as, as example, uh, we have a Rotary Club office. Uh, we were thinking of creating like an incubator space uh, for companies. And uh, the idea was we would leverage our, um, you know, you can see the, the clientele, our members here are all businessmen. Uh, they could lend expertise or valuable in, uh, in, insights into the market and open up doors for them, uh, as well as funding, of course, like personal funding. We, we may be personally investing in, into the companies. But um, what, what is that? Do you think is that a fit for what kind of impact investing could be needed or what could Rotary do uh, in terms of uh, the, the pipeline. Yost, why don't you take that? 
Yeah, I think there's two or three ways of looking at it. So first of all, I would say absolutely fantastic uh, initiative and you should do it. You should do it not in a way, I think, that, that um, you know, you, you're giving funding and hopefully something good comes from it. I think you should do it as something, you know, very prestigious and, um, you know, really focus on quality. So you shouldn't do it as another philanthropic effort. You should you should then do it, really use the merit and the, and the experience of the business man and woman in your community to create companies that are extremely strong and very high quality and help them and enable them. I think then it would be a really powerful platform. Um, completely different way of looking at it, um, which which is you know not directly related, but just as a general comment. I, I think we have to move away from um, you know fr from this view of okay, we're tr these are uh, social ventures. One day they will save the world, and we'll give them a, li a little bit of philanthropic money, and hopefully you know we'll give them a bit of a push in the back, and they will be fine. That 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 has to happen as well, but for a really small number of companies. Um, asset-wise, would be a very small amount of money. Um, but the real thing that needs to be done is in all your, in my, in everyone's investment portfolio, we should say, okay, you know, we normally I have roughly 10 or 20 percent of my investment portfolio invested in alternative investments and um, private equity or private debt that's hugely impactful, that has a market rate return. That's how I would allocate that money. Which, of course, if you think again about um, the 2.5 trillion gap. I mean, that, that moves the needle. To help a couple of social ventures to be successful, that, that's not going to move the needle at a scale that we need today. I mean, the other, the other way to think about it is, like I mentioned earlier on, a lot of foundations have an endowment that is invested, uh, and then that kicks off income, uh, which can be used for pure philanthropy. So now you can even link the topic in a sense. Or you can even I do, you do, you do your investment in the education space. You know the example we gave of a company like that, and then it generates returns, and you use the returns, for example, going back to your earlier example, to help um, uh, to get orphanages off of the ground because it's harder to find a business model that would work there. So you can you can be really kind of well, thematic or on a specific last, topic, but yeah, yeah. Re recycling. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Another question from uh, Bing Matoto is, uh, what is the current situation of sustainable developments in, in the Philippines? Uh, how much investments are coming in, uh, in terms of this uh, project? So you have one project, how many more are coming along? Yeah, maybe James jump in as well, but for, specifically for the fund. So, um, so as you saw all the way in the beginning, the, 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 the slides we saw that impact investing is, is just south of $1 trillion. And sustainable assets is whatever, $40 trillion. No? That, that's the bulk in a sense. Um, so the impact investments, if I would look at, at what um, kind of on the platform for, from a CS point of view, what have we been, been doing in the last 18 to 24 months, uh, we have focused on a solution where we raised, um, you know, I think in total 150 million for an education focused uh, solution. We've raised, um, I think, close to three or 400 million for a healthcare focus solution. We're now raising $150 million for, for an impact solution that as one of the key countries in that fund is the Philippines, for example. Um, so you could expect, you know, um, tickets of, you know, whatever, $10 million and on several of them going into the Philippines. Now, that's really small, but I'm now talking again um, about pure impact investing, and that's just for us as a, as a player. Um, if, if you talk about sustainable investments, which is what you kind of alluded to earlier, I think there are massive investments happening now. So we have in the Philippines, the Asian Development Bank, so that's more from a development finance point of view and infrastructure point of view. Then we have um, the enormous um, development that's happening at the moment. And, and we have done events with the corporate, with the listed companies, actually in Makati, uh, to talk about their ESG practices. So that's more looking at the other side. So not the investor side, but the corporate side saying, okay, guys, um, we have a conglomerate. What are activities that we maybe should spin off? We should invest broader in the, in more sustainable strategies. Uh, power generation should maybe you know try to buy more assets in the renewable space, et cetera, et cetera. This will help us to have this 
ESG score or reports that are done by your Sustainalytics and MSCI and what all their investors are using, yeah, this 40 trillion. Um, so we can make sure that we score better and we have more interest from investors coming our way, et cetera. So that's definitely a huge movement. Um, I think there's rules now on the sustainable reporting kicking in as well. So this, this is a huge uh, driver and a huge movement happening in the Philippines as we speak. So if I think it uh, right, uh, what's good about your bank is that you're kind of creating the framework or the oversight to kind of check the investments and kind of put everything in order. Because, you know, difficulty of choosing an individual project, you don't know, um, you know, what's in the project. We have that problem a lot in Rotary of what to invest in or what, what to start up with. Uh, you do a bit of a the, the, the due diligence, so to speak, uh, ahead of time uh, for these projects. Is that correct? Yeah, so but that's the hardest part. So I think the hardest part is, and you're absolutely right, and 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 you know we have that discussion with with many many families in the region. There, there are a lot of kind of smaller companies that maybe knock on the door of larger families and and coming with great ideas and with the phenomenal intentions. But what we're trying to do here is to professionalize the for return impact investment space. And you're right. You need to have a professional asset manager that has made for the last 25 years investment in small companies knows exactly how, you know, how the corporate partners would work, how the other equity holders in, in the fund, how the underlying you know, network of families or parties involved in the business, how they stand in the communities to have a foot on the ground. If you are making an investment out of the Philippines or out of Singapore into the Mekong Delta in Vietnam, you need to have a team on the ground. So, so absolutely, I think, I think you should try to think of a way to, to distance yourself um, in, in the final decision process or make a very clear investment process, put it in place for the, for the companies that are for profit and you would put your normal investment dollar in them. I think that's really important to completely professionalize that. But that's still coming back to James' earlier point. So you can still have a bucket of companies that you think, oh, this is a great idea. It just needs patient capital. Or maybe the first years it doesn't return so much or it should first scale bigger to become, you know, actually revenue. Um, um, it starts to be able to generate revenue because the base is large enough or something like that. So yeah, you can, you can have these different pools, but I think you should on, on for-profit impact, very strict, like you would do with any other normal company. And just another angle. Um, what some foundations do is they will create a liquid portfolio first of stocks and bonds or funds, and then they will use that over time to invest in the private market, the venture capital, the social enterprises, and so on. So you've got this pot of liquid capital, which has daily liquidity, uh, which you can use as, as your main uh, pot, and then the, the money can go in and out of that portfolio instead of just holding that as cash. Fantastic. Uh, last question. Um, do you see um, what's your view on the financing of basic research and development by the private sector, uh, academy, academic, and, and government? So I guess it's more of a question of um, do you see that? Th could this be a, an avenue for projects? Sorry, it's uh, some been a delay on the invoice. Some been a delay. Uh, put your cameras on silent. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I, look, I think. Fund basic research and, and um, uh, the early stage pre-commercial research is absolutely vital and we're not, we're not doing enough of it. Uh, so I think there is a huge role for both companies to step up as well as, um, as, well as for um, governments uh, and universities and research centres uh, to step up there as well. And I think climate change is the perfect example. Look, as long as coal is cheaper than renewable energy, it will be used. I mean, you're not gonna tell poor countries to abandon coal completely if, if it's the cheapest source for giving their people power. So really, you know, we can subsidize this uh, renewable energy on the edges, and, uh, but it's, it, it was the research and development that has allowed renewable energy to reduce in perhaps 80% in cost, where it, in some, some situations it can be competitive now uh, to coal. So we need to keep going on that research and development because, you know, like they said, um, the stone age didn't end because of we ran out of stones, right? So, so the same with the fossil fuel age, 
uh, won't end because we run out of fossil fuels. It'll end because we find something better and cheaper and cleaner. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, with that, with, with, uh, I think we end our Q&A portion. I think we move on now to uh, the president's response. Uh, sorry, um, Dominic, I think you have a few slides you want to end up with uh, for the talk. Uh, I was just going just gonna to sum up. Um, if you would like to you know, take this forward, we have something called a green carpet day, which we can do for um, individuals or families or, or groups of people where we spend you know, a few hours running through the different strategies that you could implement based on your own situation. And we've also have a range of publications. Um, we've just released one called the Double Delta of Impact Investing, which we covered some of in this program. So uh, we can certainly circulate this uh, to you um, after this webinar uh, for you to circulate to your members for additional reading. So that's, um, you're welcome to. Uh, thank you, absolutely. Uh, I think uh, our chief of staff, Ron, will distribute the, the, your slides and any uh, of your links after the, after the meeting. Please contact our secretariat, Ron. Okay, uh, President uh, Peter, could we have your response, please? Thank you, P.P. Carlo. When we are faced with natural calamities such as the typhoons that just hit our nation recently, we are always reminded of how vulnerable we are and how we should be more mindful of how we are treating our environment. It also digs deep on how we go about doing our business, including our investing habits and preferences. When we think of investing, the first thing that comes to mind is financial, financial returns, right? Well, that's the reason why we invest, for our money to make more money. And most of the time, we don't even know how our investments are used for as long as it is making money. But what if we can invest in a company that makes our investment grow and at the same time contributes to the community, changes people's lives, supports our advocacies, or even takes care of the environment? Wouldn't it be great to know that your money is doing good, not just for you, but likewise to other people and to our planet? And, it would be, and would it be great for us to invest in something we really care about and at the same time gives us our desired financial return? I don't know about you, but it sounds very retarian to me. Maybe that's what Herbert Taylor was thinking when he formulated two of Rotary's four-way tests almost a century ago. Is it fair to all concerned? And will it be beneficial to all concerned? This was, in fact, the message of the video played by our speaker, James, earlier. We can do good while investing. Our speakers today have explained to us how impact and sustainable investing work. It is investing with the specific objective of achieving positive social and environmental impact as well as financial return. Our traditional investors, before they invest at some stocks or company, normal, normally look for financial data. Yeah. They look for metrics like sales, cash flow, market share, valuation. Well, apparently nowadays that's not all. Now they also look at the performance metrics called ESG or the environmental social and governance metrics. Environmental metrics include energy consumption, water availability, waste management, and pollution control. It makes efficient uses of resources, and it asks the question, how efficient is the company at managing its resources and in looking after the environment around it? Social metrics include human capital, things like employee engagement, and innovation capacity as well as supply chain management labor rights and human rights. It asks the question, how well do you treat their clients or how well do they treat their workers? Is there diversity around the management of the workplace? And the government's, government's uh, metrics refer to the oversight or com of companies by their boards and investors. It refers to share class structure and governance structure. ESG is the measure of sustainability. Sustainable investing incorporates ESG factors and financial factors into the investment process. This is what our speaker used, referred to earlier as ESG integration. And more and more, companies nowadays look at sustainability not just as an important factor, but crucial to business success. Now there's about 31 trillion USD reportedly in assets globally tied to ESG and the industry is growing. The private sector has started this new way of responsible investing more than a decade ago, 
and they have been performing as well, if not even better. Even governments are following through this trend. In July last year, the UK government is the first country to launch its zero emission target by 2050. Our human population is both growing and aging. We have over 7 billion people all over the world and 4 billion of those are demanding for food, water, and energy. We consume natural resources faster than we can replenish. And the emissions that are mainly responsible for climate change just keep on increasing. COVID-19 has created for us a new normal. Maybe this concept of impact and sustainable investments is also the new normal when it comes to investing. For, in for instead of just investing in a company that does not do bad things or what our speaker Yost referred to earlier as exclusion to people in environment, it actually changes one's perspective by making a conscious effort of investing in something that does good things to people and to the environment, be it in a company that produces goods and services that promotes one's health and well-being, or in a company that promotes fair labor conditions and equality among workers, regardless of sex, race, or culture, or one that employs the less fortunate or persons with disabilities. Call it responsible investing or investing with a cause, ethical investing, or even investment for a change, or if you will, if you will, but the fundamentals of this type of investing are simply solid. Furthermore, we have to admit and embrace the fact that when it comes to present day investing, there is a generational shift happening with the millennials and the Gen Zs. If you observe them, they want to consume differently and they care so much for people and the environment. Maybe we should learn from them. After all, the future is theirs. As the saying goes, we didn't inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrowed it from our children. So on, our, on behalf of the Rotary Club of Makati, our lobby aunts are the district governor, Chacha Camacho, who is incidentally the, uh, whose brother is the uh, former secretary, Lito Camacho, is the vice chairman of Credit Suisse of Asia Pacific. The other Rotary, the Rotarians and the different Rotary Clubs in our district, especially to my classmates, the perfect vision presidents, our Rotaractors and all the other guests in attendance, please accept our heartfelt gratitude for taking time and sharing to us your insights on the topic, investing for impact and sustainability. Once again, thank you, Yost and James. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, President Peter. Uh, please uh, adjourn the meeting. Right. On behalf of the Rotary Club of Makati, the 16th regular Meeting is hereby adjourned. Okay, picture. Picture. Please, uh, stay and show a picture. Marga. Marga. Yeah. President Marga. Yeah. Join the meeting. On behalf of the Rotary Club of Makati, President Rojas, I now adjourn this meeting. Okay, picture. Calm down. <laughs> okay, one, two, three. One more. One, two, three. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Please uh, let us Thank know you. if you need any uh, copies of the slides. Um, and maybe one day when the COVID is over, we can.